I think you're going to get so much like interesting data from this approach just because also you get so much from like transcriptomics and then like different organs as well. And yeah, I think there'll be so many like interesting questions you could ask just from your data alone. <laughs> you're laughing. I think yes. it's true. No, but, like, because we're like, they're, they're, we're totally like hiring, you know, more computational biologists and like doing more modeling because we have millions of cells from different species and with dozens of interventions and like different biological axes and all this stuff. We, I know we have all that data and I would like love to be able to just like spend a hundred years going into all of it. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I had the great pleasure of speaking with Martin Bork Jensen, who was previously a postdoc at the Bok Institute for Research on Aging, but has since gone on to create Gordian Biotechnology, a company that have created the first in vivo therapeutic screen to improve drug design for complex diseases of aging. In this discussion, we chat further about how this screen works and what the company hopes to achieve in terms of therapeutics, as well as Martin's recent project Impetus Grants for Longevity Research and also his general interests in the aging field. So hi Martin, thank you very much for joining me today and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. Thanks, Eleanor. I think this show is great. Uh, I mean, there should be more things out there that are really uh, trying to make all of the aging biology understandable to everyone and uh, make it clear like what's happening and, and what's real and so forth. So I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, and obviously, I'm a fan of your research as well. And so I thought just like to ease ourselves into this huge topic of aging research and longevity, it'd be interesting to first kind of hear about what got you interested into the field. And also, I know that you were previously um, at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, and um, you've done some work on mitochondria. And so I was wondering if you could also tell us a bit about your contributions uh, to the field as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I'm, I've been making contributions in different uh, areas of aging, or at least trying to. So what got me interested was um, honestly, like, teenage existential angst about like, what's the meaning of life? You know, like what <laughs> everything. So I think many people have that phase maybe. So as a, I don't know, 15 year old around that, um, I was just trying to figure out like, what was the most uh, meaningful thing that I could spend my time on and uh, creating time, which is now the tagline for Gordian, um, seemed like a good one, right? Because whatever else you value, the more time you have, um, the more you can experience it. And so that was kind of the uh, origin. Um, but of course, I didn't know how one went about doing that. And so that's what led me to become a scientist and go into training um, to do research. Um, first in back in Copenhagen, where I'm from, uh, first in um, nanotechnology, and then um, for my PhD, I went to the National Institute uh, on Aging in Baltimore and did most of my PhD there um, and part of it in Copenhagen at the um, Center for Healthy Aging, the University of Copenhagen. Um, and the PhD was more focused on um, DNA damage and the diseases that accelerated aging disorders that happen due to mutations in DNA damage proteins, for example, Werner syndrome, um, I didn't work on Hutchinson Guilford's progeria, which is a more well-known one. Um, so that was a PhD. And then for my postdoc, um, so then I had a brief stint back in Denmark where I had to be in the Air Force because we still have mandatory military. Um, and then for my postdoc at the Buck Institute, um, I wanted to, I guess from my PhD, it became clear that like there were many different mechanisms that were part of the overall aging. And I wanted to not go narrow, but kind of get a sense of the broader landscape and try to find the levers that we can use to um, advance human health through the understanding of aging biology. And so I joined the lab of uh, Henry Jasper, who's now at Genentech, but then was at the Buck. And uh, the lab is mostly focused on stem cell biology. And I did do uh, some work in those areas um, using fruit flies. Uh, but my main project was this um, phenomenon called the mitochondrial unfolded protein response. Basically what that means in lay terms is that um, there's a certain type of stress that can be sensed by the mitochondria inside of your cells. And um, a couple of other labs had in worms already shown that if you induce that stress early in development, then you can extend the lifespan of um, the animals uh, 
uh, in their adulthood. And that was kind of interesting and weird. Like, how do you get these lasting effects? And so that project appealed to me uh, for two reasons. One is that it was mitochondria and mitochondria um, are just really central uh, to a lot of things that uh, we keep finding in the aging biology field, like these nutrient sensing pathways and NAD uh, metabolism. And uh, so that was one interesting part of it. The other interesting part of it was that there was apparently something you could do that then had a lasting effect on your, your health and your physiology. And so if we could figure out what that was, that would be cool. Um, and so the primary focus of my project there was uh, two things. One is show that this isn't just a worm thing. So sometimes we find stuff in one organism that can extend lifespan, but it might be specific to just that non-human organism. And then it's less interesting. So show that it can happen uh, in multiple organisms. And then what hadn't been done at all before was like, what is actually better? And I think that's a that's an interesting question for the whole field. Um, I won't go too deep on that yet, but you know, we often find like, and then the mTOR pathway. And that has been known to extend lifespan. And so therefore this is not surprising that this thing activates mTOR or inhibits, sorry, mTOR and therefore lifespan. But like what's actually better, right? Like what is it that made the organism not die? I think that's a question I'd love to see. I mean, it's, it's a tough <laughs> question, but I'd love to see more people just getting at that one. So I tried to do that um, and I got um, stonewalled by uh, activation of FOXO, which is another one of these uh, genes that we keep finding um, in different organisms. And that's also uh, one of the few in humans um, sort of out of the genetic studies that have been done on big, po big populations, um, one of the top two uh, genes that is associated where certain variants of it are associated with longer lifespan. So that was the first half of my postdoc um, around this mitochondrial stuff. Um, and then uh, after I had finished that project, I started a new project, um, which is focused on kind of inter-organ aging and how inflammation from your intestine, or at least in a fruit fly, uh, the intestine can reach the brain and then affect the function or the neurodegeneration of the brain. Um, and then I left, <laughs> which I'm sure we'll get to. Cool. No, that's really interesting. So it seems like you've covered quite a few of the different, I guess, like hallmarks of aging. So um, from your research has like, so obviously you've got your own kind of perspective on what aging is. And so how would you kind of describe it? I mean, do you think the mitochondria are more central than we currently think? Or what, what are your opinions? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess I have a far from unique and not original, but um, not super common view on like what is aging um, that has been shaped, I think, by you know, jumping around and making things live longer in different ways, right? Like clearly it's not all DNA damage because you can also do something else that extends the lifespan of a mouse um, or whatever organism. And so the way I think about it is increasingly in terms of systems biology and how does, so to give a, an analogy, how does a company or a country fail? Right? Like there's some kind of like you start a company, which now I did, of course, um, and then it becomes a big company and then it can sometimes like doesn't make it right. Like it kind of goes downhill. How does that happen? And I think that's um, actually pretty pertinent to how does aging happen? Um, a company like the human body or like any multicellular organism is a lot of different components that are doing specialized function. And uh, there's a system in how all of that works together and the system can kind of fall apart. And that's what I think um, aging is um, in sort of colloquial terms. It's a decline in the um, consistency and purity and uh, signal strength of information flowing through um, an organism. Uh, and so that's why there are many ways that it can fail. And when something fails, you see influences on other mechanisms of aging, right? Like the whole thing goes out of whack. So if we go back to the company analogy, um, you know, let's say that your uh, engineering team for making new Apple laptops uh, are doing a bad job, right? And then the laptops suck. And then the sales department's having trouble because like the product is not good. And then like money comes in and then you fire people and then morale goes down. And so like there's an interconnectedness of all these things. And that's 
I mean, I'm probably biased, but that's what I feel like I see in, um, in the aging field as well. There's countless papers showing that when you disrupt mitochondrial function, then you can have an effect on telomere length, or then you can have an effect on inflammation and so forth. Uh, so that's kind of my personal view is that you've got a, a complex system that you're trying to, to optimize. And so you might need, I don't know, more ecologists in, <laughs> in aging guiding the, uh, the molecular biologists. Nicole, that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. And so from your kind of description, would you agree that aging and then is really hard to study or like what are the, why is aging hard to study? Yeah, I think aging is hard to study for that reason uh, and probably for other reasons. Um, we don't have a perfect definition of aging, right? So the best thing we have is maybe like nine hallmarks or seven pillars or whatever your preferred version is. And even in those papers, they're like, this is a non-exhaustive list. And some of the hallmarks are different classes of entities than others, right? Like some of them describe, like intracellular communication is one of them. Like that just describes everything that happens in the body pretty much, right? Yeah. So that's a very different scope of hallmark compared to like short telomeres. Um, so yeah, I don't think we have a, an awesome definition. And in my opinion, yeah, the definition that we have comes back to this like complex systems. Um, and yeah, that's just a really hard thing to study, especially with the tools that we have. So I think biology has thrived on using often reductionist tools and not reductionist in a sort of derogatory way of like, you know, not uh, expansive, but rather um, precise where you can go into a pathway and you can say, okay, let's look for epistasis. You know, if we remove this thing and we think this acts through this and we can like block this, then we can test that hypothesis in a precise way. But nonlinear multi-body interactions, uh, pretty hard. Like we just don't have great tools uh, for studying that. And so I think that's something that would really benefit the aging field is having more tools that measure not just the nodes of the network of aging, but also the edges between them um, in four dimensions, right? Like including the time dimension. Um, and so then the other obvious, like, you know, my postdoc, I was making flies live longer. That's a terrible assay to be your bread and butter, right? Because it takes three months. <laughs> and the more you succeed in making it live longer, the worse it gets. Um, so I think that's also um, a big challenge for the aging field. That the only great metric we have is lifespan or you know, function over time. Um, and that one is slow. And so if your iteration speed is really low, then your rate of progress is going to be lower. So I'm a huge proponent of like biomarkers, but uh, biomarkers that are interpretable and mechanistic. Yeah, so I think I agree. I think that it is very challenging. And I, I also agree that now we seem to be getting these improved tools to be able to study the complex system of aging. And so I think that nicely kind of leads me on to talking more about Gordian biotechnology. And I guess, um, firstly, would you be able to explain like what led you to um, creating Gordian and what is it, how are you trying to tackle and understand the aging problem? Yeah, for sure. Um, so where we last left, left off in my uh, life story, um, I was doing the second project of my postdoc on this um, intra-tissue inflammation signaling. Um, and I actually got a grant to go start a lab around that um, thesis. But when that happened, I kind of looked ahead. I tend to be a, a, a looker aheader uh, in life. Like I kind of take things to the, okay, but what really happens, uh, you know, in the end, which is maybe why my uh, original sort of like thinking about, but yeah, but then you're just going to get old and die. So what was the point of the whole in-between part? <laughs> I'm not a good uh, celebrate in the moment guy. Um, so I was looking ahead and thinking, okay, if I study this particular aspect of aging, like I've studied different aspects of aging before, um, when am I going to be working directly towards um, using the knowledge that I gained over, you know, almost 10 years at the time to improve human health? And the answer was, you know, probably not for at least seven years until you get tenure. Um, and that's just a long time. <laughs> so, so I felt like I, I wouldn't be maximally motivated if I was in that thing, because I would have had this sort of tickling of like, okay, but like, what are we going to do with humans, right? 
Um, and if you're not maximally motivated, you're not going to do, you know, your best at it. And so it's yeah. kind of a lose lose. Um, and so eventually after a lot of, uh, considerations, I decided that that wasn't the right thing for me to do. And then kind of had talked to different people, explored different things, um, eventually decided that, um, you could in a biotech focused on aspects of biological aging, like that would be the most aligned with what I want of like a team that's working super hard towards a shared goal. Um, and then there was a whole process of finding the right person to do that with, um, finding the right co-founder and finding the right idea. Um, that was like a year long process um, at least. So compress all that into, I met my co-founder Francisco Laporte, um, whom I eventually started Gordian with and we went through a lot of different ideas. Um, and the idea that became Gordian was pretty uh, simple in a way. It says um, aging is important for most of the big diseases of aging, right? Like there's a reason they all are correlated and go up together like this. So like uncontroversial to people in the aging field. Um, two, what we already addressed, I don't know exactly what aging is. And if I don't, then I can't make a perfect sort of cell culture model that captures all of it. Like there's nothing that captures aging except actual aging because we don't even know what we're supposed to model. And it seems like, you know, different organs playing together is clearly part of it um, and having an immune system and all that stuff. So, okay, so we should, if we wanna cure age-related diseases, we should factor aging into the search test system. Um, the only good system is actual aging, so in vivo, um, and we don't know what to do. So we wanna be able to ask a lot of questions, right? Um, and so if you have to ask a lot of questions and the answer, get answers in the most relevant environment, which is in vivo, now you need a way to do high throughput testing in vivo. Um, whether you're going after sort of aging itself or uh, specific diseases of aging, same deal. Um, and so then the question was, well, can we do that? Right? <laughs> and the, um, the inspiration for the name was basically that, you know, there is this huge puzzle or not of like all the complex biology of aging, which I had spent a long time trying to figure out and, you know, untangling it just, it wasn't going to get there in the next 50 years. So is there a way that we can, um, without knowing everything, get the right answer by just asking these many questions? Um, and so call, cut the Gordian knot. Um, and so that's the idea, running a lot of tests inside of living animals. And of course, that's, uh, tractable without any unique technology if you just had a lot of animals. But once you start talking about aged animals that have spontaneously developed um, diseases and uh, frailties that are relevant for humans, and maybe a mouse is not always the best model, that's a whole topic. Um, I'm not anti-mouse by any means, but certainly for some uh, areas, they're unlike humans. Um, there just aren't like those animals don't exist. You can't go out and do uh, drug discovery the way that let's say Unity Biotechnology or any other classic biotech company did it um, purely in vivo if your test system is like an old horse that has spontaneously developed osteoarthritis. Like we don't have 10,000 of those. Um, and so the idea that we had um, for how to solve this is, well, what if we can test many things per animal? Um, what if we can put many different potential therapies into um, the diseased organ uh, of an old animal and then find a way to understand what each one did? And that's basically, uh, that was the conception idea of the company. And that's what we've spent uh, the first two years since we started um, at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, um, building and constructing and then uh, proving that it works. And now we're um, scaling that up and applying it to find diseases, uh, find treatments for diseases. Cool. So um, I also previously saw some work that you presented um, talking about using your approach to look at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So looking at age associated diseases. And so I, I believe from my understanding, the way it works is that within one organism, you can then give um, to one specific tissue. So for example, the liver in this case, um, different genes such that individual cells get one gene and then they can overexpress that gene. And so I guess in a long winded way, I was trying to ask, could you explain exactly more about the technology itself and what techniques you're using and how these kind of, um, 
these screening processes actually work? Yeah, for sure. Um, and so first off, maybe I'll address um, this like diseases, aging, um, what are we doing there? So I think it's probably familiar uh, to your viewers. Right now, since we don't have a perfect definition of aging, there's no like going to the FDA with a trial that says like we're targeting aging and we're going to make people younger and therefore they're going to not have diseases in the future. And not just the FDA. Like I think the FDA doesn't mind this, but they're just, okay, tell us what that means and how you're going to measure it, um, which will take a lifetime, right? So there's initiatives in that direction, but like it's not there yet. Um, and likewise, you know, in terms of how would you actually, you know, measure whether the drug works, get it reimbursed, all this stuff. So like the world is not quite there yet where um, the promise of um, longevity, biotechnology, um, aging biology to actually prevent diseases from happening is um, straightforward for a company to kind of go after. And so what everyone is doing currently is um, going after specific diseases that um, happen with age and where there's a well-established path towards like, does your thing do something? But then with treatments that you believe um, could work across multiple diseases of aging because it's targeting something that's kind of fundamental. And in our case, um, also with confidence that it'll actually work in older people because a lot of drug discovery for diseases of aging just uses young animals. And it's like, great, you'll find a drug that works for Alzheimer's and 25 year olds, unfortunately there are none <laughs> and your drug doesn't work. So anyway, that's um, at Gordian uh, at the moment, we are going after specific indications. So we have a NASH program and a lung fibrosis program and an osteoarthritis program and a heart failure program. Um, but I am excited about the fact that nothing in our platform is like works only for individual diseases. Like the whole thing, the whole setup works exactly the same if the world gets you know, ready to say, let's do preventative medicine broadly um, and, and do rejuvenation. Um, it works the same. So with all that out of the way, what is it we're actually doing? Um, yeah, as you said, um, what we're doing is putting in um, a pool of different gene therapies, um, targeting different genes that might be, um, might have the potential to treat uh, a given disease and then either increasing or decreasing the expression of that gene. And this is not particularly, even though we're using gene therapy, which is a sort of new and, and advanced technology, it's not really that different from um, what any other drug company develops with small molecules and antibodies. If you had an anti, like Humira, which is the best selling um, drug, I think of all time, it's an antibody against an inflammatory um, protein in the blood and that just helps disease. So you're just reducing that protein. And likewise, what rapamycin does, which your viewers will know about, is it inhibits uh, mTOR, right? mTOR is target of rapamycin. So that's the same as just turning mTOR down. Not literally exactly the same. There is actual nuance yeah. there, but fundamentally the same thing. And so what we're doing is um, creating these libraries of gene therapies that target for increased or decreased activity of a whole range of genes, or it could be combinations of genes. And then taking, um, taking that library and putting it into an animal. And because it's, so this is why we're using gene therapy. Um, what we're delivering is actually a little virus that has been uh, gutted of its normal viral um, content. And instead it, contains this DNA that'll increase the, or let's say decrease the expression of mTOR uh, components. Um, and it has exactly one payload, like one uh, piece of DNA inside of it. And it's gonna go in through the bloodstream, get to the liver in this example, and then uh, reach one hepatocyte in the liver, one of the cells in the liver and deliver its payload there. Um, and then that's it. And so if we use, uh, a low amount of virus so that um, the most of the cells in the liver don't actually receive any payload, just a very small percentage of them get anything, then what you end up with is uh, still a diseased liver. So this whole environment with immune cells infiltrating and uh, cell cell communication and so forth, um, that's relatively unperturbed, but individual cells within that liver, let's say a million cells uh, within that liver out of the hundred million that are in a mouse liver, um, have received some sort of biological uh, push. 
by either up or down regulating a certain gene. And um, so this is where the technology comes in. We have these DNA barcodes uh, in the gene therapy payloads. Um, and so what you end up with is in each of these cells, some biology will change, right? Like you'll reduce mTOR activity and then that will change the, the hepatocytes biological cell state. Um, and you have millions of these independent cellular experiments happening throughout the liver. And then we have a way of um, pulling out those cells that had received a therapy and then um, using what's called single cell uh, transcriptomics, we can uh, read the state of those cells. We can read the activity of every gene um, in that cell and basically see, you know, what is it doing? And does it look more like a disease cell, which we know it started out as, or more like a healthy cell? And we can compare it to cells in that same tissue where we didn't do anything, where we delivered a payload that like does nothing. And then we can ask along many different um, sort of uh, biological activity axes, did anything change? Um, and so that gives us what's called a, a phenotypic readout for uh, have you improved the state of the disease? Um, and so that's the basic, the core platform, technology platform uh, within Gordian is this ability to put uh, in a controlled or semi-controlled way, many different things into a sick organ, have independent cellular experiments happen within that organ, and then pull out and actually interpret what happened in each case, rather than just what happened on average. Cool. No, I think that's really well explained. Um, so I think, yeah, I understand the concept that even within just one organ, different cells have different genetic um, slight changes, whether it's, as you say, increasing the expression of a gene or decreasing the expression. And so this is an, an individual cell within the organ. And then you can extract these individual cells and then you sequence them to look at the changes um, of expression. And then you, from that alone, you can understand if it's got a more of a healthy state or a disease state. Yeah, that's exactly right. Cool. So I think, the, so the example that um, we've already spoken about is in the liver, but like what, what kind of like other um, diseases you've mentioned, osteoarthritis. And so how does it work in terms of delivering this, these different genetic changes, these gene therapies to different tissues? Is that something that's quite easy or is that quite challenging? Um, it's not totally trivial, but uh, basically we are um, following in the wake of people who have pioneered gene therapy, um, delivery to different tissues. So the, you, in the US, the first uh, gene therapy approval um, was Luxterna, and it was approved in 2017 for um, a genetic disease uh, causing blindness. Um, so um, Catherine High and others like, pushed that forward. Um, and at this point, there are um, hundreds of trials doing gene therapy in humans in a range of different organs, liver, uh, muscle, heart, uh, eye, brain, lung, uh, cartilage, uh, probably some that I'm forgetting, um, where there's this whole field that's like, just like blowing up. The gene therapy field is very hot and there's a lot of activity and there's a bunch of problems and people are addressing those problems. And what we're doing is just relying on the work done by all of those people to uh, first find the, uh, the right way to do gene delivery in just animal models, which is what we're doing first, of course, um, and where the bar is lower than doing it actually in a clinic um, where safety is an even bigger concern and also the doses are higher and so forth. Um, and yeah, we're just <laughs> fortunate that they're paving the way uh, for us. And, you know, we're doing some development and optimization stuff at Gordian. Our platform can be used for many things, including optimizing gene therapies. Um, but there are, we're focused on the areas where things, where paths are being, uh, not only paths are being trod, but like the roads are getting paved by other companies. So I'll let other people take that risk. Um, so in the liver, you know, like that's that's done. Like we we deliver gene therapies to the liver. We've done that in many humans. There are still concerns about um, toxicity at really high doses and manufacturing and so forth. Um, but those are what the rest of the field is focused on um, for curing uh, primarily genetic diseases. So where they know exactly the gene to put in, right? Um, and then the future of gene therapy is going to be, okay, this technology is really amazing. It can do all these things. It can do targeted things. So you don't have, you know, off 
uh, effects on some other tissue, and then you have all these side effects. Um, but for many diseases, the problem is we don't know what we actually want to do. And so that's what we were figuring out. And then, you know, coming up behind all the uh, delivery methods development that's already happening. Cool. And so once you've done this screen and you've like identified certain genes that look quite promising in terms of their transcriptome, their sequencing readouts, what's the kind of next step? I mean, do you then just have that one gene and you do it in one mouse alone? Or do you like combine multiple genes together that you think might um, work well together, be like synergistic? Is that the kind of idea? Yeah, it all depends on the science. So I think both of the things you said are definitely on the radar. Um, for sure, we have to, like our screen is a screen and screens will always have false positives, um, ours too. Um, so you do want to follow up and validate. And you can do that by putting all the stuff into a single mouse. Now, keep in mind, you're uh, you're still living in, in in normal biology land where everything happens in mice. But, you know, for our osteoarthritis program, we're already in horses. Our heart program is in pigs and so forth. So it might not be a mouse, but um, <laughs> which is like really, you have to sort of like wrap your head around that. Um, so doing that sort of saturating high dose single target, that's a very important follow-up experiment. It's also really important to... Um, get as much confidence that what you're doing is relevant in humans as possible, right? Because you don't want to cure mice ultimately, or even, uh, or, well, <laughs> there's, probably, there's actually a decent business in curing horse osteoarthritis, but <laughs> we do want to cure humans also. And so there's different things you can do there. I mean, in our, in our um, bioinformatics, there's a lot of bioinformatics and sort of uh, fancy data science that happens here, obviously. Um, and we are getting uh, within the company and, and externally um, human samples as well. So when we do analyze the results of the screen, we are looking for like, is this shift that happened something that is preserved in or conserved in human diseases and so forth. Um, but you can also do that in the validation stage, right? So you can go into models, let's say for, for osteoarthritis, um, there's something called an explant model where you can take out some of the cartilage of the knee. Typically happens um, when people are having knee replacement surgery because nobody has cured arthritis yet. Um, and then you take some of that and then you can you can do additional experiments there just to confirm that your stuff also happens in, uh, it works in, in human context. Um, but yeah, the combination part of it is really interesting because I think a lot of these age-related diseases, they are just complex and they have different types of biology going on. Um, and so being able to map that out, like what I'm really excited about what we can do is we can do these huge screens. So normal drug development, you usually have a, a target hypothesis. So let's say A beta 42 is the right target for Alzheimer's and you find stuff that hits that. And then you do animal models that test that hypothesis. Um, and if your hypothesis is wrong, then it doesn't ultimately doesn't work, right? Um, and you, you focus on like pushing the drug forward. So of course we need to push drugs forward, but before we get there, we can get in vivo, like relevant model data across many, 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 like hundreds of thousands of genetic targets. And then we can look at that whole landscape and say, which way do we want to go, right? So we get this aerial view of the entire like downstream uh, preclinical and clinical development um, and we can then decide like what makes the most sense. Maybe it's a combination therapy. Uh, maybe this thing is a gene therapy. Maybe um, there's a different modality. Maybe there's a drug already on the market that we actually discover will work for some other indication. Um, so I think that's really the power of our platform is to give us that high level view and then figure out what are the additional tests that we want to do to determine that this is really uh, going to be solid in the clinical trials, which is of course the part where it gets really, really expensive, <laughs> you know, hundreds of times as expensive as uh, running our screen. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so, well, as you haven't said that, um, the single cell sequencing, I guess, has a somewhat cost as well. And I was actually interested in that because obviously one of the reasons why there's a lot of excitement around single cell um, RNA sequencing approaches is the fact that you can use it to see <clears throat> like heterogeneity within like an organ, for, for example, or like a population of cells. And so just like natural heterogeneity um, within the different organs that you're looking at. And so because your approach is mainly like single cell transcriptomics, does that influence the data, like the background noise in the sample? 
And then from that, are there like alternative ways in which you could also try and get like an assay to see how effective a different gene is? So like whether it's imaging or what kind of like other tools do you think can be used? Yeah, so there is definitely heterogeneity. And the good news is that we have, um, we have visual on that, right? Like we can see it in our data. And so we can always just choose to sequence more cells. Uh, which is moderately expensive. So as you pointed out, like single cell sequencing is not as cheap as like taking photos of cells, but taking photos of cells um, is not as high throughput and it doesn't work as yeah. well in vivo, right? <laughs> so um, so I think there's kind of, there's two, two, two answers that I want to give. So one is back to uh, what we were saying before. The screen is to find hypotheses, which we then go and back up, right? So like, there, there are lots of other data modalities, both still based on single cell, but looking at chromatin accessibility or adding a spatial element um, with spatial transcriptomics that we can follow up on the interesting hits with. And then we go into the whole animal physiology um, with those hits. And then we test, you know, single thing in one animal, measure whatever, blood cholesterol, uh, inflammatory cytokines, histology, all the usual assays that everyone would do. So like the follow-up for us definitely involves uh, different modalities. And that feeds back into our uh, transcriptomic analysis. So the cool thing about using the single cell transcript, well, there's several things uh, other than the fact that it gives a single cell readout, which we like fundamentally need, otherwise you can't do this, right? Um, is that the, so to speak, language that it's in is uh, gene expression. And the uh, interventions that we put in that are gene therapies, they exist in the same language. There's no translation that happens. Um, and so if you have a traditional uh, molecule and you got some phenotype that says this is better, often the problem is in a small molecule screen, you don't actually know what happened. Like you didn't know what you did. Um, and so you have to figure that out. So it slows down. Whereas ours is much more like the COVID vaccine, like sequence the virus, you know what you want to target, design nucleotides that target that, and then you can like go, go straight uh, back there. And we can also add other, so when we add other modalities to our transcriptomic data, um, we can, and we do this um, very actively, um, we can find the transcriptomic signatures that represent certain physiological outcomes, let's say fibrosis and like different severities of fibrosis. So we kind of take this tr full transcriptome and um, create modules that predict certain other stuff based on the other data uh, that we've generated. So in addition to just sort of generating that data to validate what we're doing, it also feeds back into what we can actually interpret from the transcriptome. Um, and especially once you add the per perturbations to it, right? Because like biology is really hard to understand as a static snapshot. You don't wanna have a hypothesis and then like put a thing in the test your hypothesis, see if what you thought happened uh, would happen. So yeah, that's the main thing. And then in terms of the cellular heterogeneity, that's definitely, you see that in these diseases and we can see that in the transcriptome and there's inter-animal um, heterogeneity, right? So. Um, and interpatient, right? Like different patients will have different outcomes. Some people who have fatty liver develop NASH um, where they have inflammation and fibrosis and some just don't, they just have fatty liver. Um, and we see that in, in the mice as well. Um, and we use that because, so this is a, a part that actually gets really, you know, you get a, a freebie benefit of doing the pooled in vivo screening instead of, um, using individual animals. So normally you take, let's say 10 animals in this group and then 10 animals in this group and you'd give them one treatment and a different treatment or control treatment. And then you say, what changed? The problem is that the animals are all different. And so um, if the animals in this group were just intrinsically different in some way, now you've got like a, a problem that like this, you know, plus the treatment is not this, it's like different animals plus the effect of the treatment and you can't disentangle them. And of course, people are aware of this and they try to normalize, like you look at all the weights of the animals or you certainly have the same sex and the same age and so forth. But still there are things we don't know about. 
And so when you do the pooled in vivo screening, you have uh, controls in each animal. So we can still do 10 animals and just split our screen over more animals, even though I often say, you know, put everything into a single animal. We don't have to use just one single animal. We can use different animals with different biological phenotypes. And then we have controls in each one. And so you get the effect vector of the, uh, the potential therapy you put in and you say what uh, is the effect of this relative to doing nothing in that same animal. And then you get that across the different backgrounds. So we actually can utilize the biological variability of these diseases um, to understand um, when, like, does this intervention always do something? Or is it only if you have a certain starting state? Are there some of these drugs that might be good for preventing progression to NASH, but not for like reverting NASH? Um, which gets super valuable once you start thinking about your clinical trial and like what are the patient segments that you think it would be valuable to go after. Yeah, cool. That was really well explained. And so I guess at the moment you've spoken about different age-associated age -associated diseases, but how would you, if like the FDA is now like, yes, we can study aging. Um, and so what, how would you adapt to look at aging itself um, and we spoke earlier about how it's complex and intercellular. Um, how would you maybe adapt your current approach to look at maybe multiple organs at the same time? Is that even like possible? Yeah, so this, this gets to, so I think Gordian is a good idea because I think you wanna be in vivo in aged animals if you wanna cure these, ideas, these diseases, right? So like that's the starting point. The other thing I think is that for aging, uh, like if we really want to do something about aging and, and have a beneficial impact on health through aging. Um, I think, I don't know how many people think there's a silver bullet, kind of like one thing that will just do everything we need. Um, probably many people would say, no, it was probably not a sil silver bullet, even though there's exciting things, you know, partial reprogramming, whatever, um, that might look like that. Um, but our system for finding things where like you need to do this in this organ and then this in this organ or cell type and they're like different things is uh, pretty limited. Like we don't have a lot of work going on that would even get at that because almost every intervention we put in it's in the form of a drug or a genetic knockout or something that affects the whole organism. Um, and so if we do need to do this sort of modular fine tuning organ and cell type specific push uh, in an aging direction, um, I think Gordian is kind of a, a backstop for the whole field. Like if that's really what we need, then we're developing technology that allows us to figure that out um, to a certain extent. Like we're still limited in how much we can study nonlinear interactions between different organs. Like our, the way our platform is set up right now, it, it's not good at figuring out that like, if you do something in this organ, then this is what happens in this other organ for technical reasons we can skip for now, right? So, so it's, it's only a start, um, but at least it is a start of trying to map out even the things that we know are, can be sort of beneficial for aging, like IGF-1 signaling or something like that. Right? Like it's in the brain, you want maybe less of it. And then in like your bone marrow stem cells, you want more of it as you age. And like, we've seen already different examples of like this pathway is like an aging pathway, but there are other instances where it's like not beneficial, right? Um, and personally, I suspect that the reason we keep finding these new transcending pathways is because those are the ones that work like net positive, but that there are plenty of examples of like, you can make this tissue better with this small nudge, but then it makes something else worse. And so you don't see anything in the lifespan, right? Um, and that's something that we can map out um, with our technology because we're finding cell type specific, like what happens when you do a certain push. And when we create these disease maps, like I said, where we can see, you know, this is what all these perturbations do to all these specific biological um, axes, um, in this disease and in this disease and in this disease, if we think that, you know, lung fibrosis and liver fibrosis has a shared etiology in aging, something that happens, um, then we'll see that. And we'll have biological features that we create in our sort of transcriptomic space um, that correspond to, you know, what have you, the hallmarks, telomeres, senescence, all these factors, right? And if the geroscience hypothesis is correct, then we'll start to see um, that some of these diseases have a big role being played by mitochondria or by senescent cells. And we can see where that overlaps. And that lets us not only um, 
you know, we can do the same strategy that another aging longevity company would do, which is like, I, I take this drug, I'm starting an osteoarthritis trial, but I think that it'll also work in this other indication. Yes, that, plus um, we've mapped out whether it's gonna work in that other indication because we've done a big screen, right? And we've identified these modules that represent shared things. And so we start with an, not perfect information, but like an informed path towards like what, what over the sort of overlapping but complementary set of nudges do you need across the body in order to get to an overall healthier state and maybe much healthier? Ooh, I think you're going to get so much like interesting data from this approach just because also you get so much from like transcriptomics and then like different organs as well. And yeah, I think there'll be so many like interesting questions you could ask just from your data alone. <laughs> you're laughing. I think yes. it's true. No, but, like, because we're like, they're, they're, we're totally like hiring, you know, more computational biologists and like doing more modeling because we have millions of cells from different species and with dozens of interventions and like different biological axes and all this stuff. We, I know we have all that data and I would like love to be able to just like spend a hundred years going into all of it. Yeah, no, for certain. I mean, I have, so earlier this year, I got my first like RNA sequencing data set myself for part of my like PhD project. And literally cool. um, I still haven't, I mean, I still need, like I could spend the rest of my life probably looking at it. I mean, well, I don't know, almost, but yeah, I yeah. completely understand. Um, but going on from that, um, you obviously get all this data and information and you can make predictions about what genes are going to be uh, good to activate or inhibit for different diseases. And so going from that to then like the clinical trials, are we talking supplements or different molecules that inhibit the, 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 pro the proteins encoded by the genes? Or are you thinking more gene therapy as the ultimate therapeutic outcome? It depends. Um, and so we are... Not supplements, like we're plan we're going the FDA route, um, but it could be gene therapies, it could be other biologics, or it could be small molecules. Um, once again, that's really guided by once we have mapped out the landscape, we can see the best path. And so for some organs where, um, let's say we find something for um, osteoarthritis, which is like an isolated tissue, so it's small volume, um, and a gene therapy would make sense because the actual hit that we got is increased activity of a transcription factor, which is not something that any, you know, like the estimated, I'm not sure how accurate these estimates are, but, you know, like rough estimated how much of the genome can we target with small molecules? It's on the order of 10% of the genome. And then when you add biologics, you get another 10%. But 80% of it is like, we just don't know how to do this thing. We generally don't know how to activate a transcription factor or mediate a protein-protein interaction. Um, or better at inhibiting things and activating things and so forth, right? So it's very possible that what we'll find in our screen is that the strongest biological path towards um, reversal of this disease is through something that doesn't make sense as a small molecule or wouldn't really be possible. Um, and so that would be a nudge towards gene therapy. Um, also, one of the challenges for gene therapy in the clinic right now is can you make enough virus? And so you'd much rather use gene therapy for something like the eye um, where you, know, you only need a small dose uh, of virus. Um, knee joints would also work uh, for that. Um, conversely, you know, it could be that you find something where a target where like there's already a well-characterized antibody or a small molecule that has passed your phase one trial already. And then for sure, you'd want to in-license that to cut years off of your um, clinical path. So we are uh, somewhat agnostic. I think it's um, long-term. I'm very bullish on gene therapy because you can do these targeted perturbations um, that uh, won't, will, if you need a cocktail of things to like really get at aging, um, then it would be best if each thing had a more sort of targeted and organ specific effect, right? Um, so for aging in general, I'm very bullish on uh, gene therapy long-term. Um, and in the short term, you know, we'll look at those paths and we'll take the one that makes the most sense. If it's gene therapy, it's probably Gordian will do more of the heavy lifting. If it's a small molecule, maybe we'll partner with um, some big pharma company um, who has a stronger med chem department uh, or will in license something. So yeah, it's agnostic. It's not, uh, <laughs> it's not, it depends on what makes the most sense once you've seen the big picture. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. Um, so 
obviously you do a lot of research um at Gordian and at the same time or more recently you've now um co-founded maybe I'm incorrect there um impetus grants for longevity research so you're now also um involved in helping um other researchers who are also studying aging to get funding for their research and so I was just wondering if you could talk about a bit more about it and how that initiated and yeah what, what are your goals for that yeah 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 I don't know if, if uh, I guess co-founded makes <laughs> makes sense um I mean I just want the field to move forward as fast as possible uh, towards improving human health that's kind of like the overarching ambition and the prime directive um and so the longevity impetus grants started um sort of serendipitously um, where I was at an event and I was hearing a presentation on the COVID-19 FAST grants, um, which uh, happened as a response to the immediate impact of COVID-19, obviously, right? And then the, um, the inconsistency between like the need to apply science to this problem, because obviously like the solution was in science as we've now seen, um, and the typical timelines of like scientific funding, which in the US um, through the NIH, um, the sort of the cycle is that you apply and then it'll take four or more months before it gets discussed and then you'll get a score. And then like the money is typically in hand like a year later. Um, and so, you don't want to wait a year to do COVID research. This makes perfect sense. And so um, Tyler Cowan and Patrick Collison um, started this thing called COVID-19 Fast Grants where um, they had experts um, review proposals to work on COVID. Um, and they, after only a couple of weeks, you could get funding to do something. And I saw a presentation of um, Patrick was presenting this um, and just looking at like what happened, you know, and it's, I don't know, it's impossible to measure scientific impact, but you know, in terms of all the standard metrics of like people published findings, you know, clinical trials were started and so forth. Um, it seemed to work really well and like not that differently. So that made me think, okay, we should try doing this for longevity for different reasons. One is that longevity is um, just as herb urgent as COVID, right? And this is a little bit maybe controversial statement, but <laughs> literally 100,000 people are dying a day from age-related diseases. If you can find some way to really like alleviate a wide range of age-related diseases through uh, applying aging biology, that has a huge impact on human health around the world. Um, and so I feel that, you know, this is uh, super urgent. Um, there's all kinds of discussions you can go into in terms of the demographics and climate change and all these reasons why we need to fix that. But basically we do or healthcare won't work. Um, and um, the aging field is still underfunded at the basic research level. Like in the US, the National Institute on Aging has one of the smaller budgets, um, smaller than many of the individual diseases that have aging as the number one risk factor. Um, like cancer <laughs> has 10 times the budget. Um, and half of that budget is earmarked for Alzheimer's specific research. So more diseases. Um, and then a lot of it is sociology and different things. So like the actual NIH funding that goes out for like figure out what aging is and what, how we can like uh, use that biology to prevent disease is around 350 million a year. Um, which is, you know, in my opinion, like poor cost benefit analysis and it's complicated, right? It's not that if, if everyone was convinced that this would uh, have the potential that I think it does to improve human health, then I don't think that would be the case. And there's a lot of communication that needs to happen and so forth. But certainly there's plenty of money that could go into the basic research part, especially because right now there is a lot of money going into the sort of um, startup uh, company formation part of it. And so I wanted more money for that. Um, and I wanted to take the opportunity to um, fund some of the questions, see if we could fund some of the projects that would address some of the questions that kind of really would push the field forward towards human impact again. So um, 
some of this might be that more high risk research. So we gave several examples of projects that are now super impactful for the field, like parapiosis um, from Irina Convoy and Tom Randall's lab, 2005. Um, she had a postdoc fellowship, but there's no NIH funding for like these parapiosis experiments. Um, the epigenetic clocks that you're very well familiar with, right? Like Horvath just like did all of that himself. Uh, no funding for that. Um, Partial Greek programming, we'll see how that story plays out. But that work was basically funded by a couple of private foundations and some Spanish funding. So like there are these big deal things that um, never got NIH funding. And so can we complement the funding that the NIH is doing with you know, more risky bets that like maybe 75% chance this doesn't work and 25% chance it's like a new session at the conference uh, you know, in a couple of years. Um, and a whole new field. Um, and also the type of, I don't know, like maybe unsexy work that like, like we should do some clinical trials on rapamycin. Like I, I like Matt Caberline a lot. Um, he's doing the dog aging project and like testing rapamycin in animals. Like we have these drugs that are making mice live 30% longer. And there's not like a huge carnival of like celebration going on and there's not a ton of human trials going on. And that's like kind of wild. So, so simple ideas like, oh, if this thing might work, let's test it in a bunch of pets. Um, or we have these epigenetic clocks and we don't know if they're uh, correlation or causation and we don't know what they're measuring, let's find out. So kind of this kind of infrastructure stuff, um, biomarkers I think is hugely important. So we wanted to push funding for those kinds of things, um, get more funding in general, take the concept of like fast grant to n equals two and see like, oh, could you just like, how will this go terribly wrong? And if it doesn't, then should we think about how we're, how we're doing funding? Um, and so I, um, I managed to convince um, our initial donor is um, Juan Benet. Um, who is a, uh, an entrepreneur in crypto space. He started Protocol Labs um, to put in the first several million and then um, relied very heavily on uh, the longevity apprentices. So that's actually a, a third hat that I wear, um, which is a mentoring program for people who want to uh, make an impact on aging biology, but either come from, either they come from like biology, but they don't know how do we, how do I um, put together a big initiative? How do you make something happen? Something like impetus grants, but also something like Juvenome and various other projects that are happening. Like, how do you get pull all those things together? Or they're coming from, maybe it's like an entrepreneur or something and they like, I understand how to do stuff, but I don't know what to do in aging biology. I want to develop good taste in like, am I solving an actual real problem, not a fake problem? Um, so that was a program that had started um, earlier uh, this year. Wow, it's this year. It all happened this year. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. Um, so yeah, we started. I started even thinking about emphasis grants in June this year, and uh, at this point, we've awarded uh, ten or twelve million, and kind of going up um, by the day. Um, I think by the end of the year, we'll have awarded twenty-five million dollars worth of grants or something um, like that. Um, and so, so these apprentices, they have really been doing you know, like all of this operational work um, of um, finding reviewers. I knew a lot of people, but like finding more reviewers for different areas, building um, a UI for the review. So I've been a reviewer and I had a lot of opinions about how this needed to work. Like if we're gonna, if I'm gonna review hundreds of grants, like I want to see the grant full here and I want my like review um, input to be right next to it on the same page. I don't wanna click a link right and like go to a different thing it needs to be all smooth um, set up and so forth and so they designed all those things and handle all the correspondence with the universities and all of this stuff um and um so they that program had just started in in may like a month earlier and then basically between june and september we pulled together a bunch of reviewers who are people that i trust they're all anonymous um but people that I trust to have both knowledgeable about aging, not super biased for like, this is the only thing that's worth doing and sort of progress minded. Um, and 
experts in different technical areas. Um, we did fundraising, um, where, as I mentioned, we got around 27 million total committed from uh, multiple people. So Juan, um, James Fickle put in a bunch of money, Jed McCaleb, um, Vitalik Buterin, Carl Flager, and Fred Ursum. Uh, and those are the public, and then there's uh, anonymous donations also. Um, and uh, then just tweet it out. Hey guys, we have money, <laughs> send ideas. <laughs> and hundreds of people send ideas. Um, and it was pretty hectic to review everything. We set a deadline of three weeks, um, but it worked mostly. There are a few that fell through the cracks for various reasons. Um, but yeah, we a lot of people got um, grants within a month of like writing, spending a day or something, putting together a proposal for a lot of projects that I think are like, really, yeah, very clearly this should happen. Like, please do this. <laughs> so, awesome. so that's been a ride. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can imagine. Um, but that sounds yeah, really exciting. Um, and so out of those different like projects, are there any that seem like most exciting or any that you're re- quite interested in? Um, yes, but uh, I signed an NDA to like look at all these things, not okay. to yeah. uh, disclose them. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about themes. Um, I think there were, there were a few projects that are like, um, that I really liked that were around what I call mechanistic biomarkers, like biomarkers that we could potentially use in trials and that, um, aren't black box, but they tell us something specific about the biology that's happening. So they're measuring specific things like autophagy or information. Personally, I think that's going to be hugely important. Um, next year, I'm going to be thinking more about um, biomarkers um, as well. Um, so those are cool. I mean, some of them were just like, especially some of the ones around like weird model organisms were just crazy. Like um, I learned a lot of things about interesting <laughs> things. Um, and then, um, yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's what I'll say. So I'm I'm hoping that there's going to be lots of exciting announcements, uh, sort of over the next several years, right? I mean, some of this work will take uh, a long time to do, but I'm already excited by you know if you go on Twitter, um, there's lots of people posting. Uh, not only like I got a grant, this is awesome, but also like. I got a grant and this was the best like grant experience I've ever had in terms of like the smoothness or um, some of our reviewers also say that. So I guess all my nitpicking worked out <laughs> or like I'm a grad student and I got a grant because mostly you can't apply for an NIH grant um, as a grad student, right? So like our reviews were blinded to who they came from in the assessment of like, does this have, um, does this have the potential for a big impact? And so that ended up giving grants to various people who were like not at famous universities and grad students and people who were coming from like outside the aging field per se uh, to come and do some really interesting things. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I'm already really excited about is that, uh, yeah, people get to do the stuff that they like have a, a, an urge to like, this is the really que- the question I really want to answer, right? And then if you can answer that, like, then that's great. That's how science should work. Awesome. And that's really good to hear that, yeah, people, that doesn't matter where they're from or what stage of their career, they're able to get this funding. And so is it, I mean, I think, is there certain times, can people apply at the moment or will it be like reopening later? So for now it's closed. We closed at the beginning of uh, November. Um, And um, we're running through all of the, grants that we received. And um, then we'll see what the situation is with um, funding. If there's funds left over after everything we've received now, I think most likely we will open up again in January or February. Um, Probably with some targeted, like calls for um, proposals around specific topics or questions, something like that. Um, And then after that, um, we'll see. I mean, I would love for this program to uh, continue, uh, but um, I would also love not to be running it <laughs> because <laughs> I have to run Jordan. So it yeah. was kind of like opportunistically, this seemed like such a, a good opportunity to, to do a proof of concept um, for the aging field and push things forward. Um, so I'm, 
talking to some people and if anyone uh, listening to this is like, yes, I would love to run the Impetus uh, Grants Program and here's why I'm going to be amazing at like going out and raising funding for next year's round or spring's round or whatever um, and managing the whole thing, then uh, get in touch, I guess. <laughs> and hopefully we can we can keep it alive. Yeah, hopefully. Um, so speaking more generally about just aging, are there any particular areas that you're most excited about um, or you think has got a lot of potential for the future or like more on that, like where do you see the field going in general over like the next 10 or so years? Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say biomarkers. Like it doesn't matter if you're excited about senescent cells or partial programming or whatever. Like if the way that we're going to go about applying aging biology to um, human health is to have a new pathway that could let us target like specific, you know, cancers or specific age-related diseases. That's just not optimal efficiency and transitioning to, so, I mean, the vision I have, and this is something I'll um, probably communicate much more about next year is that um, we should have mechanistic biomarkers of aging, like interpretable biomarkers for different aspects of aging. We should have a whole panel of them. And those should be measured in every clinical trial that happens in the US and, and anywhere, um, right? In, in a centralized way so that we kind of weaponize every drug trial um, to measure, does this have an effect on these pathways of aging? that we can then demonstrate, or in some cases already have demonstrated, um, are important for the development of certain diseases, right? Because this way you do kind of a, a mapping many potential drugs to a few pathways to many different diseases. And if you know these links, and if you then turn every trial that's tested, you just measure these few things. Now you are just totally, you know, in a synergistic way, supercharging, uh, the number of tests we do. And I think this is, you know, like we, 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 in our field, we'll talk about longevity drugs or aging drugs or whatever it is, right? Killing senescent cells. Now it's aging. It's not something else, right? But I mean, the things we have that maybe work or the best contenders we have, rapamycin, is it an aging drug? I guess maybe now we've co-opted it, but it's an immunomodulatory drug, right? Like there's a transplant drug, metformin is a diabetes drug. So it's not like there's some physically or chemically special thing that makes something an aging drug. Um, and so to really realize the, the power of this field to completely change healthcare, my vision is this, you know, whether it's a new branch of government or some institute that is um, developing mechanistic biomarkers, showing the links to different age-related diseases, and then um, measuring the effect of every compound on those biomarkers. It's kind of like a scaled up version of Gordian, right? Like we're at Gordian, we're taking all of the different perturbations, measuring their effect on a reduced, you know, dimensionality set of transcriptomic modules. And then we know which modules map to which diseases. You do that whole thing, but at the clinical trial scale. So that's the thing I'm personally most excited about. That's the way that I would want to see things going. Whether or not that specific project you know, happens in the next five years, we need biomarkers, right? Like there's no way we can utilize the power of the aging field if the output is like lifespan or something like that. Yeah. I'd say, I guess somewhat on from that, um, do you have any like advice for anyone wanting to get into the field or like advice more generally about um, other people wanting to do um, improve their health or like, um, yeah, what would you advise be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, improve your health. I mean, you probably already know, uh, right? <laughs> like, just do the obvious stuff of like eat vegetables, don't eat sugar, exercise more. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I mean, if you're super serious about this, I tend to say like, go and do something in the aging field. Um, like it's not that big of a field, it's thousands of people. Um, and people, more people doing the right things um, can have an impact, right? I mean, look at the impetus grants, right? Like I helped kickstart things, the donors were invaluable, but the donors are excited about doing things in the aging field, right? And then a small team of motivated people, the longevity apprentices, like were able to make that happen. Like it would not have happened if those people hadn't been like 
committed to spending time on, on doing right things in the aging field. Um, of course, you have to find the right things to spend time on. And that's why the apprenticeship started, was to give people good taste in aging biology, as well as this operational um, uh, operational capability or training, if you will. Um, and there's different, you know, there's different ways that, that you can learn about that. I think the key things are, yeah, well, so I'll do a little bit of self-promotion, which is like, go to my pinned tweet on Twitter and you can put the link or something <laughs> where I try to talk about a bunch of this stuff of like, what's, what, how are you going to get mis misled when you first enter the aging field? Um, and then as part of that, there's a, a, a link to a video, which you can also find on martinborgjensen.com. There's a link to that. Um, it's like a three hour whole thing where I spend more time on this of like, what are the bottlenecks? What are the places people should go? So those resources already exist, um, but try to find, try to find someone to trust. Like try to find some, like you don't need to go get a biology PhD if you have a friend who has a aging biology PhD, right? And like whom you can actually trust. And then try to think about things from a, I would say from a perspective, and this is back to the apprenticeship, like from a perspective of like, where's the end goal and what are the blocks and like, how are we going to get there? But think through that whole process um, or at least try to think, I mean, this is super hard, right? And like, nobody has the perfect answers, um, but try to think about those things and, and then spend your time on like, what is it that most needs to be done? And especially if you're willing to do uncool stuff, like there's a lot of stuff that needs to get done. We need a lot more aged animals to do our studies, like not just Gordian, but like the whole field. If, what I said before, like if every, you know, number one risk factor for cancer is aging for most cancers, like a few like testicular is not true. So all cancer trials should happen in old animals, like, uh, sorry, not trials, preclinical research. And that's not happening. Um, and it's not happening because people aren't thinking that much about aging maybe, but it's also not happening because there aren't that many animals, right? Like you couldn't do that. So somebody needs to, like, here's a project that I'm also kind of the apprentices might work on, like go and really map out what are the ideal model organisms to model different aspects of human aging. And then with that map, we'll know what are, what organisms do we need to start massive cohorts of animals aging now, if we want to like run some experiments on them in five years, totally unsexy. Nobody wants to do that, right? Like everyone wants to find a new drug, <laughs> right? Um, lobbying efforts, you know, like biomarker infrastructure, like the biobanks in Europe are great. Um, and everyone always goes to like UK biobank to do anything, even from the US, because it's great. Like, could we make not shitty biobanks in the US, right? Like doing things like that. There are lots of things that you can do if you're like sincerely motivated um, to do something. And people are welcome to like, send me an email. Um, I'm kind of like, I guess uh, adjacent to a lot of different efforts that are happening. And so if people are like, here's what I want to do. Um, like what's, who should I talk to? Who can help me? Or like who, or, yeah, what's, how should I make a contribution to the field? I, uh, until I get totally bombarded, um, I'm very happy to answer those because I want people to like, yeah, to be able to, uh, fulfill their desire to like, add purpose and like make a big difference in what they think is most important. Good answer. And I was just about to ask you, where is the best place for people to contact you? Obviously I can put your links in the description. Yeah. Um, there's a website, like my full name, martinborkjensen.com. Um, Twitter is good. Martin B. Jensen. You can put all those links in. So um, yeah, probably Twitter is Maybe best if you're on Twitter or email um, hello.martinborkjensen.com at gmail.com um, will work as well. Um, and then for, yeah, and then just describe what's going on. There's different paths like the apprenticeship and or just like, I want to do stuff. <laughs> Which labs should I join? <laughs> or some of the ones that just got impetus grants. A lot of them now they're like, hey, we got money. We need postdoc. We need grad student. Awesome. Well, I think that's a really great way to end. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you and hear about what you're doing at Gordian, but also beyond just helping the aging field in general. It's just been yeah, great to kind of pick your brain and learn about, I guess, the forefront of the research. Thanks so much. Yeah, this has been really fun. Enjoyed it.
That's good to hear. Right. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.